Okay, we continue uh, looking at Our Lady's virtues, and this morning we begin by talking about Our Lady's poverty, the virtue of poverty. Now, that's probably not intuitive. I would say most people don't think of poverty as a virtue, okay? But it is. It's a virtue. Uh, it's actually counseled by our Lord in the gospel. It's one of the evangelical counsels. You know, when our Lord said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and follow me. So that refers to material poverty for the sake of the kingdom of God, you know, renouncing your goods as the first Christians did at the beginning of the church. You know, they sold their properties and placed the proceeds at the feet of the apostles and distributed everything according to one's need. All right. Um, now, someone might be tempted to use that as an argument in favor of communism. Okay, but um, that was based on charity, right? Not imposed by rule or uh, authority or anything like that. And the reality is... Uh, religious today, like Franciscans and Dominicans and who take a vow of poverty, uh, we have all things in common. We renounce private property. It's a form of communism, right? Community life. But again, the principle is charity and freedom. We embrace this freely and it's not imposed by uh, any outside authority. So Poverty, all right. Um, there's material poverty, all right. Uh, there's also spiritual poverty. We are assured that Mary practiced this virtue in imitation and according to the desire of her divine son, who being rich, became he became poor for your sakes, and said... If thou wilt be perfect, go, sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Now Our Lady was, in fact, perfect, and therefore she was poor. As for following Christ, she is the most perfect disciple, and therefore perfectly poor. All right, so... She renounces, um, well, actually, look at the example of Christ first, okay? He is the king of heaven, uh, the creator of the universe. He could have come into this world in any condition. Right? He had complete freedom, total liberty to choose in what manner he was going to come into this world and was going to live. Look at the example that he gives us. Look at the example. He chooses to be born in a stable, to have his mother and St. Joseph be rejected at the inn, to be born in a stable. He em embraces a poor life of hardship, Okay, the flight into Egypt, the life of common... Oh, I forgot to check with the uh, control room before I started. I hope we're okay. Uh, the life of... Uh, Common everyday work in Nazareth. Joseph was a carpenter. Our Lord was a carpenter. Okay. He wasn't born in a palace. He didn't live a royal life. This is the Messiah of the world. Right. Um, now, that doesn't mean... Um, well, I mean, look at what the scripture says. Lots and lots of warnings about the rich, the dangers of riches, how difficult it is to save your soul if you're rich. Doesn't mean it's impossible. It doesn't mean being rich is evil in itself. I mean, even the fact that I just said that sentence probably would shock most Americans. Being rich is evil. <laughs> You're right, that I have to even say that. Uh, because most people think of it, including Christians, as a blessing from God. Right? The, you know, health and wealth and happiness in this world 
are God's greatest blessings and signs of approval. And you kind of say to yourself, not necessarily. Right? Read the scriptures. Read them. All kinds of warnings. Now, it doesn't mean, as I said, that it's evil in itself or impossible to save your soul. Abraham was rich. Abraham was rich. In fact, I just read that recently. It was in one of the, it was either in uh, the Office of Readings or one of the readings for the Mass or one of the Mass coming up. I'm not sure. But uh, Abraham was rich. Okay. Um, Job was rich, then poor, then richer, you know, I mean, so, um, you know, if somebody has been given the talent and the ability to make lots of money, they should see that as a gift that's been entrusted to them by God uh, to be used for his glory, to be used for good works. But the temptation with fallen human nature is, again, to attribute that gift to yourself, to become puffed up, prideful, uh, comfortable, comfortable, presumptuous, and, and all of the rest, which constitutes a danger to your salvation. And that's why the scripture warns about it. So look at the example <clears throat> of our Lord and of our Lady and St. Joseph. I mean, they are the ideal. They are the, the models. And uh, so some examples of our Lady's poverty. She married a poor carpenter, a man of labor. She didn't marry um, the rich. They did not find room in the inn at Bethlehem. And I can guarantee you, if they had money, they would have found room. Right? That's the way it works. You have money, we'll make room for you. Her poverty was not simply a material poverty by necessity, accompanied by a desire to grow wealthy, because that's what normally is the case if you happen to be poor in this world is there's the desire to be wealthy and so we spend what we can on lottery tickets and, uh, and these type of things uh, always trying to get ahead I mean th this is uh, definitely part of American culture right is the the vice of avarice and uh, the vain glory that comes along with having, uh, you know, the best house and the best car and the best job. And, you know, this is vain glory and pride and, and all of that. Okay. Again, um, nothing wrong, again, undertaking your work as a form of service, right? You would hope that uh, wealthy Christian businessman would see his business as a form of service, um, would take pride, so to speak, in employing a lot of people, right? giving them work, paying honest wages, these type of things, and, and wanting to expand and multiply his business for that, right? I mean, you're, you're supporting and sustaining families, and we're presuming it's good, honest work, a good, honest service, and, you know, not something like Planned Parenthood, right? It was poverty by choice, right? Jesus chose to be poor. Our Lady chose to marry a poor man, giving evidence to that most perfect spiritual poverty in her immaculate soul. Okay, so we're not all called to be materially poor. Uh, but we are all called to be spiritually poor. We're not all called to profess a vow of poverty. We are all called to practice the virtue of poverty. Poverty. 
This is the essence of the virtue, to love poverty, to despise the things of this world, to desire God alone. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the blueprint for Christian life, and the kernel of that sermon was the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So Our Lady was poor in spirit and poor also in fact. Notice how this is connected with the other virtues, right? That your hope is not to become wealthy. Your hope is not uh, placed in the things of this world. Seeking your heart's fulfillment and happiness here below. But your, your hope and your sights and your aim is for eternity. We live for eternity. We live for heaven. We live for God. And so that material poverty is a great aid to that kind of disposition of spiritual poverty. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. After receiving the precious gifts from the three wise men, she still offers the ransom of the poor at the presentation, that is, two turtle doves. Those who could afford it were to give a lamb, which means the precious gifts that she received from the three wise men uh, were generously distributed to the poor. So Joseph and Our Lady didn't take those precious gifts uh, to buy themselves new clothes, to get a new house, to, uh, to then afford a lamb for the offering, uh, but rather they distributed those to the poor and they remained poor. Content with what they needed. What to uh, satisfy their needs. Saint Francis, in speaking of his love for and espousal to Lady Poverty, undoubtedly had the Blessed Virgin in mind. The Pavarello being a son of the Pavarella. What's that? Lady Poverty, right, Lady Poverty. So, you know, that's a, a virtue that we could certainly um, embrace better here in our own country. Um, and again, talk about uh, this being as a virtue, right, as a virtue. Uh, to overcome this materialism. As Friar Roderick is an expert on the advertising industry and how it's all um, capitalizing, right, on avarice and this uh, unchecked desire for material goods and convincing you that you know, this is what you need, this is good for you, and instead of uh, promoting virtue, basically. So, wasn't there a movie, I just remember a movie where, uh, uh, I think it might have been the Michael Douglas in uh, Wall Street, was it a movie where, doesn't he say something like, greed, it's what made America great, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, so wouldn't it be wonderful if spiritual poverty made America great? You know, not real poverty. I mean, we don't want to be destitute, and, you know, and uh, live lives of misery. That's not the idea. 
right? But to really be detached, to be generous, and uh, to have everybody having their sights on heaven, you know. And when you do that, it's so much easier to be charitable in this world. It's so much easier to be patient in difficulties. Question. You mentioned the offering of for the presentation. Did, I guess I was thinking the presentation occurred within is it forty days of the first male child? Or is that age three? So I guess my question was I thought it took the Magi a couple of years to make it to uh, the Holy Family. So would they have... Yeah, the chronology of how that all played out isn't crystal clear, so there's some uh, disagreement even between biblical scholars. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's some disagreement, but the I think there is agreement. There there is agreement that the presentation of our Lord in the temple. So there are two presentations that we celebrate in the church. One is the presentation of our Lord. One is the presentation of Our Lady. The presentation of Our Lady is when she was three years old, and Anna and Joachim presented her in the temple to live there and be educated there, and and that. The presentation of our Lord, right, is 40 days after the birth, uh, which coincides with this rite of purification for Our Lady. And it's a ritual of redemption, where you buy back your firstborn. So you offer him at the temple. Um, and yeah, this calls to mind uh, uh, the well, I don't want to make any mistakes here, but it, you were going to say something? No, no, no. I, I mean, I understand your point of it. I was yeah. just thinking you trying to... Right. So the Old Testament law... So the Old Testament law is that uh, a lamb is to be offered. And I think they also uh, say that you could offer a calf. I'm not sure. I'd have to read the passage myself. Um, but if you were poor, if you were poor, two pigeons, two turtle doves was an acceptable offering. So we know from that offering of Joseph and Our Lady that they were among the poor. Yeah. We don't really know what age Jesus was when they went into Egypt either, do we? Um, Assume, you know, he was born, presented, went into Egypt, but I'm not sure about the time, you know, whether it's like... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've read that uh, before. Saying, you know? It's not exactly clear, but, you know, Herod uh, wanted to murder the children two years and younger, so it's kind of presumed that it was within the first two years. Um you know, I, I guess the, you kind of think that by then they weren't in a stable anymore, but found some other housing down in the area. I mean, right, it, it, there's not uh, great clarity uh, with that, how that... The wealth from the Magi to go, you know, to help them settle in Egypt and stuff like that. That's entirely possible. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions about that uh, uncommon virtue of poverty? Uh, again, this is the reason why religious profess the vow of poverty. You don't profess, you don't profess something and offer something to God uh, that is worse, but you profess and vow something that is better. You know? And the point of poverty, of professing the vow of poverty, is to overcome uh, the concupiscence of the eyes. Okay, that is this desire to have and possess and, and own. 
So St. John talks about the concupiscence of the eyes, the concupiscence of the flesh, and the pride of life. Okay, these do not come from the Father, but they are of the world. And these are the three concupiscence that result from original sin. So the religious professes poverty as opposed to the concupiscence of the eyes, avarice, uh, chastity as opposed to the concupiscence of the flesh, bodily pleasure, and obedience as opposed to the pride of life, one's self-assertion and aggrandizement and all of that. And we get this from the gospel, that our Lord counsels this. If you want to be perfect, you know, but we're all called to be perfect because Jesus said, you must therefore be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. So we're striving for Christian perfection. And when he says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions. Uh, what he means is, if you want to be perfect <clears throat> more speedily, if you want to remove obstacles and hindrances to evangelical perfection, then sell your possessions, possess, profess poverty, and follow me, which Im implies chastity and obedience. I think because she says, God made everything in the world for me to use. Mm -hmm. But everything in the world, is in, things in the world may not get me to heaven. So what I have to do is discern what things are going to help me get to heaven and then reject everything else. So that's sort of a poverty where you just take what you need mm -hmm. to get you to heaven, take what you need to help you love God, love Mary, Right. right. Using things on the way. For everything else. Yeah. And not even consider having that stuff. Right. And that is a, a, a form of poverty that uh, I think that we're looking for. Yeah. That's the uh, the holy indifference of Saint Ignatius. That's the word that he uses, uh, at least regarding the, the spiritual poverty. Uh, but yeah, so we need to use things uh, just in passing, right? We are passing by and we make use of things uh, in as much as they are useful uh, to us and uh, as we make our path to heaven. Um, but that, that's one of the problems is that we, we love things and use people instead of using things and loving people, right? All right, any other comments about the uh, poverty? Okay, we move on to Our Lady's Obedience. We already spoke of Mary's unsurpassable humility it follows that she was always perfectly obedient. St. Maximilian Kolbe says, he who obeys is humble. Right, so we're talking about obedience uh, to legitimate authority, making legitimate commands. God, of course, being the ultimate authority in giving us 10 commandments. So the person who observes the 10 commandments has at least a minimal degree of humility. Right? I mean, it is a concrete sign that you're humble if you obey God with regard to grave matters, to grave things. You have at least a minimal degree of humility. Whereas what was Satan in his pride was, I will not serve. I will not obey. 
the Annunciation, Our Lady called herself the handmaid of the Lord, and said, Let it be done unto me according to thy word. Handmaid, or the Latin is ancilla, which is a feminine form of the word slave. Handmaid, the servant. Mary's obedience is in sharp contrast to Eve's disobedience. This is found most notably in St. Irenaeus, in the Catechism, paragraph 494, quotes St. Irenaeus. He says, At the announcement that she would give birth to the Son of the Most High, without knowing man, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary responded with the obedience of faith, certain that with God nothing will be impossible. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Thus, giving her consent to God's word, Mary becomes the mother of Jesus, espousing the divine will for the salvation wholeheartedly. Without a single sin to restrain her, she gave herself entirely to the person and to the work of her son. She did so in order to serve the mystery of redemption with him and dependent on him by God's grace. By being obedient, she became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Hence, not a few of the early fathers gladly assert, the knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. With the virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. Comparing her with Eve, they call Mary the mother of the living and frequently claim death through Eve, life through Mary. Our Lady is different than the other saints in this regard because other saints were always wounded by original sin and had to do battle with evil inclinations. Not so with Our Lady. St. Bernardine of Siena says, because Mary was free from original sin, she found no obstacle in obeying God. She was like a wheel that was easily turned by every inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Hence, her only object in this world was to keep her eyes constantly fixed on God, to discover his will, and when she had found out what he required, to perform it. Some more examples of Our Lady's obedience. Our Lady, in order to please God and fulfill His will, she even obeyed the Roman Emperor and made the 70-mile journey to Bethlehem to take part in the census. Traveling in winter, pregnant with child and extremely poor, so poor as to have to give birth in a stable. So, legitimate command from a legitimate authority. The Roman Emperor requires a census be taken. Our Lady obeys. And notice how in obeying she fulfills the prophecies that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, not in Nazareth. This is all divine providence unfolding and divine providence is capable of using pagan emperors as God's providence did in the case of Cyrus. You know, through Cyrus, I think it was the prophet Isaiah actually prophesied, I think it was Isaiah, or maybe it was somebody even earlier, who prophesied that God would raise up Cyrus by name uh, to free his people uh, from the exile, the Babylonian exile. And sure enough, uh, Persian emperor, I believe Cyrus was the Persian emperor, uh, here, here we go, a man comes on the scene, uh, the Persian emperor, whose name is Cyrus, and the Jews go and show him this prophecy. You're the man. 
and, and he basically believed and let, let the people go back to uh, encourage them, helped them, supported them to go back to the Holy Land. So God using uh, his providence, disposing these kinds of things. Her obedience to St. Joseph. Okay, so she's obeying secondary instruments in God's plan. The Roman Emperor, now St. Joseph. In departing at night on the even more difficult journey to Egypt, respecting the order established by God within the family, notwithstanding her superior dignity, virtue, and intelligence. In fact, God himself respecting the order he established, that makes sense, by sending the angel to Joseph at night. Okay, saying, take your wife and the child into Egypt. The angel wasn't sent to Our Lady. And Joseph made the decision. And Our Lady obeyed. Her heroic obedience to the divine will in offering her son up to be crucified for man's salvation. <clears throat> so she did not oppose this, although it was a sword in her own soul, a sword piercing her own heart. She did not oppose it. St. Anselm says that if the executioners had not nailed our Lord to the cross, then Our Lady would have done it for them. This is logical. Why? Because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, the sole means of fulfilling God's promises, because he figured God must be capable of raising the dead if he commanded him to do it. Our Lady, much holier and more obedient than Abraham, would she have not done the same? Our Lord, in what some consider a derogatory statement, actually extols Our Lady's obedience when he says, Blessed is the womb that bore thee. But he's... Rather, that's the woman uh, who's praising our Lord and our lady. He says, blessed is the womb that bore thee. And Jesus responds, rather blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Our Lord is affirming that our lady is more blessed for always loving and obeying the divine will than for her divine maternity. Thus affirming that it is not so important as what we are doing as that it be the will of God. So maybe we're washing dishes, maybe we're folding the laundry, maybe we're preaching a retreat. What we're actually doing is not as important as, is it the will of God? Is it the will of God? So same thing with prayer, right? I mean, uh, if a mother in fulfilling her duties, which is the will of God, neglects folding the laundry and instead is at the adoration chapel. Her prayers are not pleasing to God because it's his will that she be fulfilling her duties. So that's why our Lord says, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. So any questions about, again, I would say this is another virtue that is hard to swallow, uh, perhaps in particular for Americans because we love our liberty and freedom. And we have the knee-jerk reaction of viewing obedience as something contrary to that. I suppose it not just in America, but it's becoming more of a widespread thing. Like Benedict the Sixteenth, when when he was Pope, uh, very often touched on that. You know that the gospel and faith did not um, 
We're not an infringement on your freedom. Okay. And, uh, but rather it is freeing. You know, Jesus said, the truth will make you free. Uh, so the virtue of obedience is not any kind of enslavement, but rather it's freeing. We're free to do the will of God. We're free to live in the truth. You know, so sin and disobedience is what Jesus calls slavery. You, know, you become a slave to the devil. You become a slave to your passions. Right? Anybody who is entrenched in a habit of sin, how free are you? you know, notwithstanding your efforts, you, you know, you're really struggling or incapable of breaking out of this habit. How free are you? Yeah, that doesn't sound like freedom to me. That sounds like enslavement. So, whereas the saints, uh, these heroes of virtue, they are maximally free. They are not controlled by their passions. You know, it is the will of God which they continually freely choose. Remember, um, the saints in obeying, whether they obey their spiritual directors or whether they obey their superiors or whether they obey legitimate commands of public authority uh, and obeying the will of God, th these are all free choices that they're making. So every time you, you practice the virtue of obedience, it's a free will decision. It's a free will choice. And it's ordered towards what is good, what is best, what is fulfilling. Whereas, you know, those who, uh, right, I mean, here we are, exalting choice, exalting choice, right? Uh, you know, how free are these women who are choosing or making the wrong choice, right? Ask them how free they feel. The wrong choice is more often than not uh, made under a feeling of constraint, pressures from boyfriends, pressures from expectations for your life, you know, these type of things. Where freedom is found in doing the right thing. And especially as our Lord says, uh, freedom from the slavery of the devil, freedom from the slavery to our passions and sin. Okay, uh, so that's Our Lady's obedience. Any comments or questions on obedience? Okay, we move on to Our Lady's patience. Now, patience is a uh, very, very important virtue because as I mentioned before, our Christian perfection <clears throat> consists in the perfection of charity. In St. Paul, in his hymn to charity, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the first word he chooses to define patience or describe it he says, charity is patient. Charity is patient. So we can almost gauge the degree of charity that we have in our souls with the degree of patience we have in our souls. The gospel says, in your patience, you shall possess your souls. Luke 21, 19. Now, we live in this valley of tears. That's what we say when we pray the Hail Holy Queen. Okay, this valley of tears. It is meant to purify us and to perfect us by means of trials and tribulations. By patience we shall save our souls. 
God has given us the Blessed Virgin as our model of patience. Some examples. St. Alphonsus says that our Lord's response to Our Lady at the wedding of Cana was meant to illustrate her patience. Woman, what is it to thee and to me? Her whole life as mother of the Redeemer was, in effect, marked by patience as she suffered knowing that her son was the Messiah, the man of sorrows, and the suffering servant prophesied by Isaiah the prophet. She's the queen of martyrs, model of patience. She is a martyr of patience. St. Bonaventure says, quote, a crucified mother conceived a crucified son, end quote. It is enough to consider her seven sorrows, but most especially her standing at the foot of the cross. So if anybody uh, has not yet seen or prayed at the Seven Sorrows Path, which is up on top of the hill next to the parking lot, uh, that's a good place to go to, okay, in our own sorrows, when we're struggling with patience. Okay, we can pray and meditate on Our Lady's Seven Sorrows. There is a relationship of suffering and patience and charity. Patience comes from the Latin word patior, and that word patior means to suffer. Okay, so the patient person is one who suffers, but suffers well for love of God, for love of neighbor, in faith. St. Paul says that charity is patient, as I mentioned, and it makes us saints. The letter of James, chapter 1, verse 4, says, And patience has a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, failing in nothing. So as we grow in patience, that is perfecting us and purifying us and preparing us for heaven. And actually, this is why uh, the trials that we encounter in this life, which are meant to purify us, if we don't embrace them in a virtuous manner, that's what purgatory is for, right? To purify us of the dross, the spiritual dross, when in fact, the God's plan is that we be purified in this life so that when we die, we're prepared and go straight to heaven. All of the saints are martyrs, either red martyrs by shedding their blood or white martyrs by patience. For this reason, St. John in his vision saw all of the saints carrying palm branches. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9. He says, After this I saw a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne in the sight of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So all of those who are saved are carrying palms in their hands, which is a sign of martyrdom, either red or white. We can be martyrs without the executioner's sword if we only preserve patience, says St. Gregory the Great. Advantages for us. There is no greater means of accruing merit for heaven than by patiently enduring trials. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, For that which is at present momentary in light of our tribulation works for us above measure exceedingly in eternal weight of glory. God protects us from attachment to ourselves and the things of earth precisely by sufferings. The prophet Hosea chapter 2 verse 6 says, I will hedge up thy way with thorns.
Our Lady can help us. Consider that she endured crosses, though she was immaculate and entirely innocent. So crosses in this life purify us. Our Lady didn't have need of purification. It was entirely gratuitous on her part. Our Lady is called Comforter of the Afflicted. She will comfort us in our trials. She is the white ladder. That is, she makes the road of sanctification easy and rapid. That is, the purifying trials are less severe and shorter in duration if we go through them with Our Lady. And yet, they produce more fruit because there is more love. So that's a, a reference to the uh, two ladders that St. Francis had the vision of. There was the red ladder and the white ladder. Uh, the red ladder, his, he saw his friars trying to climb this red ladder to heaven, and they kept falling off and struggling and not getting there and that type of thing. And he saw the white ladder extending to heaven. On the top of that white ladder was Our Lady, and the friars were quickly and easily ascending that white ladder and making it to heaven. Okay, so this process of sanctification, of preparing our souls for heaven, goes easier and more quickly with Our Lady and with greater fruit because there's more love. Okay, we're going to stop there. So we did pretty well. Actually, there was only... Uh, the spirit of prayer and meditation is the only thing that we didn't get to. Okay, are there any um, final questions or comments before we close and we've got the rosary at 9.30 up in the chapel. I'm just going just to say that that's, that's a real key, I think, is we were just talking about lattices, about being our afflictions are less severe, less time because our lady helps provide us with love, you know, and teaches us love, and that's but that's the real key, is that whole, that whole thing of the, of the love that she imparts. Right. Remember, because uh, suffering and trials and purification, it's not for its own sake. It's like when Our Lady of Fatima told the children, uh, will you accept all of the sufferings that God wants to send you? Okay. You mean God wants to send sufferings to three little children? What kind of God is this? Okay, he's sending them not for their own sake, you know, not because he enjoys or loves suffering, but precisely for the sake of, of love, okay, and salvation and sanctification, for a greater good and the greatest good. So this is a means, and it is a necessary means, right? The reason is because sin, all sin, implies a, a disordered pleasure. Again, not that pleasure is bad in itself. It's not. God is good and he's provided us with good things to enjoy in this world. But we're talking about disordered pleasure, and which is sinful, right? We're ultimately sinful pleasure. So go back to original sin, Adam and Eve in their disobedience, their rebellion, you know? There was a, they were seeking after pleasure in a way which was not according, in accordance with the will of God. Uh, actually, go back even further to the angels who fell and became demons. It was the simple, uh, perverse pleasure found in the rebellious spirit. Right? Ask any teenager out there, do you take pleasure in rebelling? Sure do. Right? There's a perverse pleasure simply in the spirit of rebellion. So all sin, all disobedience to God and his will and commandments implies this uh, disordered search after pleasure. Therefore, the scales of justice require that that be repaired and amended by suffering. So... 
This is why injustice, what comes into the world in the wake of original sin, it's suffering. Sickness, death, pain, and all of that. Yeah. And we need to remember that heaven is not in this world. Okay? Jesus has redeemed us, but heaven is on the other side. Okay? We're, we're still passing through this. This is a valley of tears. This is an exile. We are pilgrims. This is the desert. Okay? The promised land is still to come. So, you know, it doesn't mean that it's um, something that is without joy. But there's always going to be an admixture. We need to be very realistic about our lives in this world. There is always going to be an admixture of sorrow and pain. Right? I mean, that's the reality. It's a fallen world. It's fallen. It's not heaven. And, and it's not our permanent home. So our hopes, you know, should not be in this world. Our hopes are not here. Our hopes are in heaven. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So again, as the scripture says, uh, or St. Paul, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say it, rejoice. But notice it's rejoice in the Lord, okay? Not in the world. Rejoice in the Lord. And with Our Lady, of course. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.